Pastor Carl here. Welcome to the Daily Message. Today I'd like to direct your attention to the book of Isaiah and chapter number 60, to the book of Isaiah and chapter number 60. Reading from verses 1 to 4 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. For the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his word. There are some dark days that we are experiencing right now. With the pandemic bordering on a depression, church and state showdowns, protests in several states and many cities over the racial injustice and the death of George Floyd. And in some cases, turning into riots, which mirror the very thing being protested. But the Lord said he would arise over us even in darkness, even deep darkness that cover the people. And his glory will be seen upon us if we would arise and shine believing and knowing that our light has come. How do I rise? In the book of Ephesians, in chapter number 6, in verse number 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Though we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, those principalities and powers are empowered through flesh and blood, whether actively or passively, we give dominion to the rulers of darkness of this age, to the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places by the decisions that we make. In Psalms 8 and 3, it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet every day and every decision, with every day and with every decision. I give dominion either to the will and the word of God or to the schemes and strategies of principalities and powers. In Ezekiel 22, after Ezekiel had enumerated through the Lord or the Holy Spirit the sins of the leaders and the people of the kingdom of Judah, God said in Ezekiel 22, 30, So I sought for a man who, among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed the deeds of, on their heads, says the Lord God. The Lord is still looking. The Lord is still looking. He's looking for a man who would make a wall and stand in the gap for righteousness. He is still looking. He's looking for people who would humble themselves and pray, seek his face, turn from their wicked ways so that he would hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. He's looking for people, for disciples who are known for their love for one another. He's looking for a nation, a nation who desires that the Lord would be their God. The Lord is still looking. Our problem today is not more laws. Our problem today is not more programs. Our problem today is our heart and the fear that grips it. 
In the book of Matthew, in chapter number 15, in verse number 17, it says, Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. In verse 20, it says, These are the things which defile a man, but the, to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. In Proverbs 4, 23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. And Matthew 12, 34, it says, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Psalms 139, in verse 23, says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties or my thoughts and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's the heart of man that determines our outcome. And we can put all the programs, all the laws in place we want until we get the hearts of men and women. There will not be lasting change. And then there's fear. But we have natural fear and opening up and getting to know one another and understanding each other across cultures, really talking about sensitivities and hurts so that we can really weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. I am mad. I'm angry because I'm 70 years old. It doesn't look like some things will ever change. I'm upset with seeing black men, particularly or black people, killed statistically at a higher rate by police officers compared to their number in the nation than any, any other group. Lynching has ended. And it should be reflected in our statistics. The Bible talks about the fear of man brings a snare. Whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. But we all have fears. Fears of different people. Fears of things that are different than we are. We all have fears. But you know, the early church bridged across cultures, bridged across racial barriers, bridged across some of these fears. And they did it through house churches. In the book of Acts in chapter number two, when uh, 3,000 are, are saved, it says in Acts chapter number two and verse number 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and all who believed were together. Though they were from different places, there were those from all around the known world who came during the Feast of Pentecost. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In Acts chapter number five, the Bible says that they departed from the presence of the council. This is Peter and John rejoicing that they were counted worthy and the other disciples rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple, and in every house, 
they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Daily in the temple and in every house. Cornelius was in a house when Peter came to him, a Gentile with the gospel. Jews were forbidden to go into the houses of Gentiles. Peter only went because the Lord gave him a vision that that which I call clean, don't you call unclean. So in Acts chapter number 10, it says, in the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them. This is Peter and his traveling companions. And had called together his, listen to this, his relatives and his close friends. It wasn't just Cornelius who was in that house. He had a house church. He called together his relatives and his close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet in worship. But Peter lifted him up and said, stand up. There wasn't hierarchy. I myself am also a man. As he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Come together, come together. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Slavery has ended. But not everybody has been accepted equally to the table. That ought not be. The Bible says that even Peter came to Mary's house and there were others there in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary. This is when Peter was released miraculously from prison. The mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Hear my point? In the temple, I can be talked to. But when I get to house to house, I can talk with. We need to be able to talk with one another. With the objective of not just hearing myself talk, but being able to learn about somebody else. I'm hurt. Because I have to take my sons and I got to teach them how to deal with police officers and you don't have to do that. My dad had to do it with me. I had to do it with my sons. But what about my grandchildren? My grandsons? When will this stop? When will we come to understand one enough, well enough, that we would not call common that which God has cleansed? Remember Paul, he went to a house, a house of a woman, she was an entrepreneur, not sure about her marital status, not sure about the children she had, but she was from another culture than Paul was from. This is in Acts 16, verse number 14. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple and from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. We worship the same God. We lift him up maybe different ways, but it's the same God. And if we have the same father, can the children get along? The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Paul met with her, not in the temple, in a small gathering. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. 
So she persuaded us. And Paul and Luke and his other traveling companions spent time with Lydia, getting to know Lydia. We want to come back and gather in a big church so we can pass each other and not really know each other. We can see someone with tears, but not ask why those tears are there. See someone angry and just all of a sudden pass a value judgment on their anger. But not really understand the source of it. I'm not just talking about you, I'm talking about me too. Because we all have gone through things, we all have dealt with things. And sometimes you may not be able to solve the problem that I have. But when I weep, if you could just weep with me, sometimes that's all it takes. I don't have that time in the temple. But we could if we go house to house. I remember when Paul came back to Caesarea and the book of Acts in chapter number 21. It says, in the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven abode and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins who did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owned this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Verse 12. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean you by this weeping to break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we see saying, the will of the Lord be done. We didn't realize I was reading out the King James Version that time. The Apostle Paul and those that were with him in a house discussed a matter that Paul was emphatic on. And they talked about it long enough until even though they didn't agree, they came to an understanding. Today, we don't dialogue long enough. We don't spend enough time getting to know the perspectives that we have, where they came from. Translate those perspectives in something that's relevant to me so that I can understand you and you can understand me. But they spend enough time with a deacon, with his daughters who were prophetess, with Agabus the prophet, with the traveling companions of Paul. And even though they couldn't persuade Paul, they left saying, let the Lord's will be done and agreeing on that. In the temple or the sanctuary, we worship and we're talked to. It's hard to form understandings Understandings are able to bridge race. Oh, I could talk to you about my frustration. I could talk to you about my anger. But that would not move the ball further down the field. And I'm tired of the ball staying on the same hash line. It has to move. And we have to move it. And I'm suggesting if the Lord has all called us to house churches, maybe that's where we can talk to one another. Maybe that's where we can come to an understanding. That maybe that's where we can rejoice with those who rejoice, but still weep with those who weep. I'm not angry at anyone. 
I'm angry at the devil. Because he has come and he has begun to take our country down a road where if we don't turn around, we'll never be able to come back. I'm not saying come back to the same sanctuary. I say come back off of destruction. The Lord wants to do something. He wants to show us just how far off track we have come. That in our sanctuaries, in our homes, in our church houses or house churches, that we would come back to him. And one way we'll come back to him is by really believing what he says. He says, what you've done unto the least of men, you've done to me. The Lord is still looking for disciples. Disciples who will say, by this shall men know that we are disciples, by our love for one another. The Lord is still looking for a people, a people that would say, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able. The Lord is still looking for a nation, a nation that would believe that the Lord is their God. We as a people of God, let us be those disciples, that people, that we could help our nation to come back to where it ought to be. These riots should not be what provokes them should not be. And I'm suggesting that maybe there's something that we can do about it. Because the Lord has led us to house churches. And in these small gatherings, Let's get to know one another. Not judge one another. Understand one another. And let's be our brother's keeper. Father God, we thank you that you have a way forward. What I'm suggesting may not be the only way forward, but I believe that it is a way forward. And let us seize the opportunity to be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. God bless you. Hi, I'm Jerry Dearman. Thank you for watching today. To not miss out on any of our videos, you can subscribe by clicking here. Or to watch another video, you can click here. Go ahead, pick one.